In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Welcome back to another edition of the Daily Memphians Memphis Grizzlies podcast. This is your host, Grizzlies beat writer Drew Hill, joined as always by columnist Chris Harrington. Let's just let's just come out hot right out the gate, Chris. Amazing Grace and Chuck, right? No. <laughs> well, I, we'll get to that in a okay. minute. Are the Grizzlies postseason hopes officially over? They're not officially over, but they have been unlikely for a while. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I've sort of, you know, I, I've sort of resigned myself to this like a month ago that, you know, maybe you sneak back into the play in race. It's a goal worth pursuing. I think it's still a goal worth pursuing today, but the odds are against it. And I, I think this season is primarily about trying to figure out your team as you go into go into the summer. And we will get to that. Um but before we get to your your movie talk right here, uh, the Grizzlies lost to the Toronto Raptors last night. Uh, before that, they played against Victor Wembanyama and the San Antonio Spurs and got a win. There was a lot of fun that came out of that game too. So we got a lot to yeah, discuss. That was awesome. Um, that yeah, for as depressing as the game was against the Raptors, it was equally as exciting against the Spurs. I thought you will remember that Spurs game years from now you will not remember that Raptors game. Yes, you will block that Raptors game completely right. out of your mind. Okay. All right, fine. We'll just let you get it out the way. You tell us what's going on. So tell mo- us about your movie tweet. Mo- Maybe this is like the only positive thing, or I guess it's not even positive. Twitter is a wasteland right now. It's uh, a it, wasteland. Yeah, yeah, it's rough. Um, moments before we began recording, the Grizzlies put out a press release. Literally, like moments before we sit, we sit down. I, I think you. I think it happened while you were walking into the building. Uh, they put out a press release about their MLK game uh, coming up January fifteenth against, I believe, the Golden State Warriors. Their annual Sports Legacy Awards, are the recipients are going to be Ozzie Smith, um, Re- Renee Montgomery, Calvin Hill, and most importantly for this particular point, I'm making Alex English. And I wondered if this means we're going to get a screening of a movie you thought I made up called Amazing Grace and Chuck. It is from 1987. I'm going to read to you the two-sentence um, synopsis on IMDb, Internet Movie Database, for Amazing Grace and Chuck, 1987. A little league player named Chuck refuses to ever pitch again until nuclear weapons are disarmed. Basketball star Amazing Grace (laughs) Smith follows the boy's example and starts a trend. This is a real movie. I saw it when I was a kid. This is that. Starred Alex English. Alex English is Amazing Grace Smith in this movie. And this movie is directly tied to this award or no? I, I, I don't think he's getting the Sports Legacy Award. I think Alex English is getting the award, not Amazing Grace Smith for his work on nuclear disarmament. <laughs> Although I think Amazing Grace Smith's work on nuclear disarmament deserves more than a Sports Legacy Award. No offense to the Sports, Le- Sports Legacy Award. I think Amazing Grace Smith was in Nobel Prize, like Peace Prize territory. And so Alex English is going to have to settle for for a sports legacy award. This is how we fix. This is how we fix all the problems in the world. That's Do right. you hear that little league pitcher right. at the South Sorry Haven, you know, house league? You just tell people you're not pitching again until Gre- war is ended. Gregory Peck, aka Atticus Finch of To Kill a Mockingbird, Bird, among other things, plays the president of the United States in this movie. Jamie Lee Curtis is in this movie. Red Auerbach plays himself in this movie. It's something, man. Amazing Grace and Chuck. Shout out. Alex English. Anyway, he's I'm, coming to town. I'm going to be honest. I don't think I'm going to watch that one. <laughs> no way. You probably can't. Well, you, you, you talk for a second. I'm going to find out where you can watch that. If you can. I bet you can't. <laughs> well, uh, I do eventually want to get into the Grizzlies game, and we'll, we can choose. I'll let Chris, once he figures out what the heck uh, is going on with his, with his movie talk, uh, choose our direction here. But... Um, the Grizzlies do you can have a watch very... Amazing Grace and Chuck for free with ads on Tubi, or oh. you can rent it for three ninety nine on various sites like Amazon Prime. There you go. It is available to be found. Listen, I'm not paying. I don't <laughs> think I'm paying to watch Tubi. That man, one. Tubi's maybe, the way to go. Maybe Tubi. Um, anyway, as I was saying, um, do, well, now that you're back, should we start with the Spurs or the Raptors? You want to start with the good news or the bad news? Let's start with the good news, man. Okay. 
That was an awesome game. It, and for it, it a was, lot was, of there was sections of the game that were kind of kind of yeah, mucked up true. and slow. Yeah, but no, that didn't I take matter. It back. I take it. That back. game was about Ja Morant. The, hey, first set aside Ja. It was about Vic, Victor Wembanyama's first game ever in Memphis. Um, you know, the, 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 the most heralded prospect since LeBron James, his debut, if you were in the building, you will have seen his first game in Memphis. That's a cool thing by itself, regardless. But his first game in Memphis was also his first game against John Morant. You got the seven, four phenom leading the league in block shots and, and the point guard who likes to hunt heads and dunk on whatever he sees. And you got them going head to head, like you know, three, four, five times throughout the game. They sort of isolated going and jog going at Wimby, and that was great. That was great fun outside of the context of everything. Uh, as I said on, on Jeff's show earlier in the week, the, the the future prognosis of Stephen Adams didn't matter in that moment. Like right. no, nothing else mattered. The standings didn't matter. Nothing mattered. It was Jaws going at Wimby. Nothing else matters. And that was great. Yeah, uh, there were. I thought you did a great job of capturing it in your column. Uh, I would highly encourage people to go read that. Uh, it was so fun because there was a buzz you could feel every single time. The, f- yes. the two guys. And like it, the first it, time you could feel the building sort of rising. It was up. less than a minute into the game and maybe just a few minutes like after t- like, you know, there yeah, was yeah, a yeah. couple balls that went out of bounds or whatever. So Jaw it gets took a switch. Like, no time at all. He gets Wimby on a switch. He recognizes that he backs up. And he dribbles between his legs twice, and you feel the whole building sort of rising up in anticipation. Yeah. It was great. And uh, Wemby got him. Wemby, round totally one. Totally got him. Round one on points went to Wemby yeah. uh, Won't be the last time. And then, you know, we had it again in the second quarter. Yep. And Ja pulled up for a three and made it, um, which honestly... I say this jokingly. We should have booed. Uh, <laughs> right, right, yeah, no, right. That, like, that was cool. Golf clap. Golf clap. That's <laughs> nice. That's nice. Golf but that's clap. not what we're here for. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm totally joking there, but yeah. he, he did make the three, so he deserves the credit there. But um, and then we got it in the second half, two different times. But really, it was a trilogy. I don't even count the the hand switch in midair. It was a great play. It wasn't really an ISO play, and neither was the dunk. Yeah, the, well, but, the hand switch was sort of in transition, basically. Went at him in right. transition. And then the other one happened too fast for it. I wasn't an ISO, but it was a switch where he went at Wimby. But it wasn't like a stop, pause, and now I'm attacking it you. It, it was sort of in the flow of the play. It yeah. wasn't true one-on-one basketball. Right, right, right. It was like, honestly, because there was a screener. Yeah, yeah, So, and I believe it might have been Marcus Smart. So, it just... That but once you got past that changed, action, it yeah. was Ja going at the rim against Wimby. Right. And got past him with a dribble move, got around him and went up. And Wimby was, you know, Ja got past him, but Wimby got there to contest. And if you watch it on slow-mo, as many Grizzlies fans did, he got a hand on the arm. There was some contact there. Yes. Um, whether he... Look, it's not Ja's best dunk. It's he not didn't his best. detonate on him. It was not a thunder dunk on top of... This it wasn't Aaron Malik, Baines. This isn't Malik Beasley in the playoffs. Oh, I forgot about just, that one. I, I, I forgot I about that one. That's the best to one. You, no, that's I the was best listening one. to you on Jeff's show talking about the best ones, and you left that one out. Yeah, so the top, the top four in no particular order are Malik Beasley in the playoffs, Aaron Baines, Jalen Smith, Smith. That's and Jakob Pertle. Those R- are the, let's rank them. Per- and Pertle 1A, 1B. Yeah, let's, there's two Pertles. Let, this is fun. Let's rank them. I think 1B Pertle is fifth on this one because I don't remember. I, I, I know it happened, but I can't visualize it. The, the other four I can Pirtle, visualize. No, the second Pertle dunk I thought was better. See, I can't I can't remember. I can't visualize it, though. You may be um, right, but I can't visualize it. The other four I can visualize. The second one came in the 50-point game. Oh, which okay. Well, that's why, what I'm thinking of. Well, well right. the other one. Yes. The, 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 the lesser Pertle, whichever yes. is the one I can't visualize. That's, that's the one I'd put fifth of, the, of those four. I would put Baines fourth. Man, that's tough. I mean, these are fourth. these are some spectacular dunks we're talking about. I would about. put Baines fourth. I would put because it was in a fifty point game. I'm going to put Pertle third. Right. Any thoughts there? Is that fair? No, I'm fine with that. Okay. Then I'm going to put Jalen Smith. Are you going to Jalen Smith? Jalen Smith's two. He that's the one where he cocked it back so far. That was he said that was the dunk he always wanted. Yeah, he said that was that was the one I always that was the one I've been. I mean, he pulled it all the way back almost horizontal. Yeah. Um, 
Did I say a three? Did I give a three? I think I did, right? I, I, th- was, I thought you were, were you saving Malik Beasley for one, Malik, or you could put Jalen Smith Malik one? Beasley is one. It's yes. the playoffs. And it set up an amazing comeback. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have no quarrel with your rankings. I, I Okay. To me, but that Baines, man, when that's your fourth best dunk, that's saying something. Yeah, this this jaw dunk would be off the list. Um, it'd be top ten though. It'd probably be top just because 10. because it's windy and it's, it's the it's context just of the moment. Yeah, the, the context, context matters. Yeah, um, jaw downplayed it. He said he downplayed it when he was talking. He didn't downplay it in the moment. He slapped the backboard he and ran the down the taps and ran down the floor screaming and, and the whole thing. Yeah, he downplayed it. He said his dad would have called it a hard layup, that it was like your first high school dunk. And when the locker room opened, he sat in his locker looking at his phone. I'm gu- guarantee he was looking at, he's reliving that dunk. Yeah. Maybe he reposted it on his Instagram. He did, yeah, story. he put it on his Instagram. But come on. <laughs> come on. Um, and then, but what I liked more was Wemby <laughs> talking after the game. Right. Because Wemby Yama essentially, you know, he, I don't think that there's like a real language barrier here. Yeah. I mean, maybe a tiny bit, but he called Joss small. So he, he said, said it was very fast and very small. Right. Who is not very small to Victor Wimbanyama, though? Everybody. Like, J- Victor Wimbanyama makes Jared and Biz look normal size. He you know? is, if you go by official NBA measurements, he is six inches taller than Jaron Jackson. I don't know if that's, it may be a little bit less than that, but by official NBA measurements, the listings six inches taller than Jaron Jackson. He's got an eight foot wingspan. Yeah. So, but I, I, what I liked is he said it was, it's just like another night in the NBA. You know, every team has a superstar that can do whatever, which I wrote, uh, is partially true because lots of teams have superstars. Lots of good players in the league. No that's other true. team has a point guard that's dunking on that's Victor right. Wembanyama. That's right. That's just the truth. No, if you if you say like, okay, we're on an island, somebody's going going at Victor Wembanyama's head. Who do you want? Jaws probably first on the list. There aren't a lot of contenders. Anthony Edwards, maybe. I mean, it's a maybe short Anthony it's a short Edwards. list. He's not a true point guard though. Right, right. But, uh, but I'm know, talking about like anybody look, in the league. Who Shea do you want to watch? Alexander. Who do you want to watch going at him? Shea Gilgis Alexander is a fantastic player to Might watch. be a better player than Job, but he is not as exciting in that moment. He can't do that. No. Nope. He can't do that. Um, so I I just thought it was a, a really fun game. The Grizzlies pulled away in the second half. Offense got a lot better in the second half. It, you're right. I you're playing a Spurs team that is that is bad. Yeah. Despite Wimby. I wouldn't call it a great game. Um but uh, it, it was an entertaining game for sure, even though it was ugly in the first half. Yep. Um, okay, on to the negatives for a minute. I was not at the Raptors game last night. I got to say, one other note, I did not mention this anywhere. I'll, I'll mention it on the pod. No one cares about me, but I'll say it anyway. That Spurs game, the first time I have personally written a game night anything on a Grizzlies home win since April. Yeah. Since April. It's kind of depressing. Yeah. Anyway. So I, I picked the right game to go to this week. I was um, only go to one. Yeah. You skipped You skipped the right one. Um, Grizzlies came out completely flat. Didn't play well. Pushed back in the fourth quarter. Got it down to five. I hated the shots they got late in that game. The jaw in particular. I, I actually went back and watched that stretch this morning. And like the Marcus Smart shot, you don't want to get that shot. But it was a catch and shoot with two seconds on the shot clock. That was that was a problem of the possession, right? The Ja three, there was 13 seconds on the clock. You got Ja Morant taking a three from the corner where he's fallen back and the defenders all over him. Why are we getting the what, what, where, why are we taking the shot? I say we as as the Grizzlies. Like, why are we taking the shot? You know? Yeah. No. Um Ja said he rushed that one. Yeah. And he wishes he could have had that. No, one it happens. But, but that, Taylor that Jenkins true. said he wishes he would have slowed the team down. He mm-hmm. thought they played with great pace, but he wishes he would have slowed the team down. Yeah. Um, I think which that's right. I thought was a pretty honest answer. And then, like, I do, I'm going to be honest. It was Marcus missed a late three, Jaron missed a late three. And Jaron had just, Jared had just made a big three. And so that one didn't bother me as much, but they should have been. They took four four straight threes. They, they didn't need that. That's right. They were down. Santi Aldama went to the line. He hit one or two to cut it to six. You're down six with four minutes to go. The next four shots were all threes. You made one of them. They closed that gap with Dez going to the basket. Yeah. And Dez is great in the third quarter for the second straight game. Like, for him to not 
be in a position to score the basketball late in the game. Like I, I even the Marcus Smart three, I understand it was a late shot clock, but, but that's but, a but, bad possession. Yeah, that's right. The possession led to a bad shot. Yeah, it did because that jaw dribbled at the top right. for too long. They passed to a guy, and like you know, I, I wrote about this too. Like Marcus has a hand injury, and it is clearly impacting him. He says he can't feel the ball very well. It's it's it has an impact on his shot right now. Right? Um, is it his shooting hand? It is his guide hand. Okay, which but still matters. It yeah. hurt. He says it hurts to catch the ball. Right. So just imagine you're standing there in the corner. And Ja is throwing a whip pass across the lane, and it's hitting you in the hands, and you've got to catch it and shoot it. I just, I don't know. I didn't love that possession. That's like the one guy on the floor that you and who wasn't shooting well in the game, right? That you probably didn't want to take the shot, and you allowed the Raptors to sort of put you in a position to set that shot up. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that hand injury, which you which you did write about this week. I had sort of forgotten about that, and I was thinking about Marcus Smart this morning. That is something that needs to be factored in as you sort of give it time with the Marcus Smart stuff mm-hmm. over the coming weeks. But, you know, he's he's 2 for 10, 0 for 5. Luke Kennard, 1 for 5, 0 for 4. So th- those, th- those two guys combined to go 3 of 15, 0 of 9 from 3. Like, you know, that that that's a real drag. It is. Um, I do I, – I, I want to talk about the upcoming road trip. I want to talk about the problems uh, coming forward. But first, let's take a break for a message from our sponsor. The Daily Memphian Memphis Grizzlies podcast is sponsored by the FedEx Employees Credit Association, offering savings, checking, and lending to all FedEx employees, retirees, and their family members. Online at FECCA.com. Do the Grizzlies have, in my opinion, it's just, it's glaring. Um, It's very obvious that the Grizzlies have a a three-point shooting problem. Um, Yeah. Is it should they be this bad when you have Luke Kennard and Desmond Bay? Now, now listen, they didn't have Luke Kennard for a large stretch of the season, which I get. But to me, it's kind of inexcusable that they've been this bad. So you have two legitimately elite shooters in Luke Kennard and Desmond Bain. You have two, and I know some fans get annoyed when they miss, but you have two what I would call plus shooters for their position in Jaron Jackson and Santi Aldama. 6'10", the seven-foot guys who are viable three-point threats, right? And then and, and this game, like, they were both good. Santi was 2 of 4, and Jaron was 4 of 8. But th- those guys are, can really can legitimately stretch the floor, right? So that should be a pretty good foundation. And it's just they've gotten nothing consistently from anybody else. And, like, you know, I think Morant's, Morant was pretty good last night, 3 of 6. But Morant started terribly, and he sort of come around a little bit. The real bummer is, like, you don't have any role players you can count on you know, I mean, the reason not to harp on it, but like the reason they went out and got David Roddy and Jake LaRavey is to give them more shooting. And that hasn't worked. And Conchar has not you know, the hope was that's a low per- low volume, but high percentage guy. And that hasn't worked. And Marcus Smart certainly has not been shooting well. And, you know, I, I but I don't it, it, I got asked this this morning. It's like they're taking too many threes. I'm like, they maybe they're taking too many. They're certainly not making enough. I don't know where the right balance is, but. It's not there. I mean, there, there's a real gap between how much they shoot and how well they shoot. They got to close that gap from one direction or another or, or both. Yeah. I mean, and I've honestly tried to think about why the three point shooting percentage has. And it's not like they've been a great three point shooting team, but it feels like they're significant steps behind where they were when D'Anthony Melton was shooting threes, you know, with the Grizzlies. Right. Um, and I don't have the stats in front of me. That's just my, my inclination. Um, so I, I think that that's one of the pieces that you really need to evaluate right now and through the end of the season because your greatest asset right now is Bain and Jack and Ja going to the basket. And you should be creating open shots for three-point shooters – and they have been creating open shots and not making them. And I think that that's really, really uh, a big key of why this offense has struggled so much this season. Like you just have to, you have to make shots. And that's what it like. It, best example is that Marcus Smart shot, right? It was a good, theoretically in basketball, it was a wide open corner three pointer, which is the best three pointer that you can take. Right. Just didn't make the shot. Um, you got to put shooters around Ja, and and 
uh, and Bain. So, did um, quasi related. He didn't take any last night, but at least he's more of a threat. Did did did, did since I was not there, did Jenkins say anything about the decision? Yes. The, at you know what I'm going to ask? Yes. Tillman well, and Biombo. That's what I'm going to ask. Yes. yes. Um, he mentioned that it was like a back to back thing. Okay. That they were giving Biombo essentially a night off, a night off, and using Tillman because they knew that they had a back to back, and they have a lot of games coming up on the road in a short amount of time. Um, and he essentially was like, this doesn't mean Bismack is out of the rotation. Right. It just, it just means he didn't play against the Raptors. So, I mean, Tillman's individual numbers look okay. The the team got blasted negative 15 in his 23 minutes. I don't think either of those guys have been particularly good. And I, to me, it's sort of hard to like make a strong case for either one of them. I wonder, I wonder if you don't, if at some point he doesn't like, let's roll with Jaron and Aldama for a while and see how that looks. Oh, he said, he also mentioned last night that he wants to see more of that. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think that's, that's right. I think you will see that. Um, but I'm talking in the starting lineup. I, I think you will see that okay. at some point this season. Um, I want to get into like what they're going to do at that center position and all that. But first, let's talk about this road trip because it's a really tough road trip. Um, and I asked you, is this over? Uh, you said no, and I, and Josh said that these aren't must-win games, but you can't go 0-3 on this road trip and feel like you've got really any chance uh, at getting back in this race. You've dug a huge hole here, and every game matters an awful lot, and so that's why losing to a team like the Raptors is so tough. You, you're, you're going to L.A., then you're going uh, you're going to L.A. where you're 1-9 in, in your last 10 road games. Then you are going to Dallas, where you are three and ten all time against Luca. Don- or excuse me, you're going to Phoenix, where you are th- uh, three and five in your last eight. Phoenix when, has been a little bit better De- lately. When Devin Booker is playing, they seem like right? they've gotten through their rough patch and they've they've gotten a little better. And yeah. then you're going to Dallas, where you are three and ten all time against Luka Doncic. Right. It's rough. pretty rough stretch. It's rough out there. I mean, get, uh, beating the Lakers would be cool. Um, it's always a cool thing to do. It's hard to do. The Grizzlies, I, I want to say they were five and a half out of the 10 spot when Ja came back. They're five and a half out today. So they've been treading water, but they've been losing ground, frankly. I mean, before you get to 10, you got to get to 12. They're in 13 now. You got to get to 12 first. They've been losing ground on that. Utah has been actually pretty good lately. So they're three and four and a half back. You know, they got a lot of climbing to do to move up one spot, much less multiple spots. Um, What do you anticipate? will happen the rest of the season from a roster evaluation perspective like what is paramount here um i think the most important thing and you sort of hate that you're in this this spot with it frankly because it's not like there's a good there's a good answer other than like if if you don't think it's working the most important thing is the marcus smart thing you gotta, and I'm. I don't think you're close enough to say that was a mistake. I, I think you gotta. You got. There's a lot more information. I'm to, surprised to you say that. Really, I. I think that's that's sort of your fourth guy, and you got to figure out whether your fourth guy makes sense on the team because yeah. your top, your first three, I think you you feel good about, and the fourth, frankly, it has not been great to this point. But he missed a lot of time. Ja missed a lot of time. Now he's got this hand injury, and I just think you got to give it more time. But I think that's the first thing you have to evaluate. I mean, do we do we feel like he is right in this role, and is he going to be right in this role going into the next season as well? I think it starts there, but it, it's everything else too. I'm su- uh, I'm surprised you didn't go with the center. Well, I, yeah, but I think that is something. It's hard. That's something that we can't evaluate, uh, right? They they have to they have to make it. They have to decide. Or they have, they have to decide whether they think Stephen Adams will come back next season in at least close to pre-injury form. Because as much as people want to like go out and get a center, when you're talking about projecting into next season, there is no one they can trade for who will be better than the pre-injury Stephen Adams for this team. But are you going to get that or not? And I, I to me, that's something they have to figure out. Because if you think you're getting that. A, that's a better player for your team than anyone else you're going to get. And B, you don't have to give up anything to get that player because he's right here, you know? Right. I, I, so, I mean, that is the most important thing. But that's that's not an evaluation that can play out during the games that we're watching. That's why I guess I thought of the Marcus Smart thing first. 
Jaron said the team misses having Steven around. Um, that he's repeating some of the things that Steven Adams would say when he was around the team that would make everybody laugh that he can't really say publicly because they're kind of he, he is notably not around the team. I, I don't think that's a big deal given how, how how proximate we are to the surgery, you know? Oh, yeah. So he, it's my understanding, is like working with the specialists and right. the Grizzlies are working very closely uh, with him there. So Ho- hopefully more closely. Than, than than whatever the situation was last summer where the intel was not for whatever reason the intel was was ended up not being good on on his prospects for return this season yeah yeah that that's i mean still i, I mean, mean just transparently they thought one thing and another thing happened oh sometimes sometimes that's out of your control so i'm not passing any blame right. on anything yeah. but that is just the reality of what happened yeah that that's that's the right way to right. I, I think to put it like you know there were videos of Stephen Adams lifting heavy weights, full range of motion. Right, right, right. They were out over the summer. He played in the preseason, was effective, and then played in the preseason. Said right. he was good to go on media day, and so why? Of course, it's really disappointing that it didn't work out. But I, I don't. Should he have? Should he have had this big of an impact on this team? Um, you know, so. His loss, I mean. Well, I mean, they were they, they had lots of other problems the first twenty five games of the season. Ja, and then like Kennard and Smart and all of that. So since Ja's been back, they are five and four. They're five and three with Ja on the floor. They were going to lose that game at Denver even if he played. So yeah. five and four. Um, five and four is not great, but like five and four would be like you know eighth or ninth or whatever right now if you if you strung that out over everything. So since Ja's been back, they have played like a play in team. Um, and so you add Steven Adams to a play in level team, suddenly maybe you're up in the top six, you know? So I, you know, I, I don't think it's that. And, and you look at, not only are you without Steven Adams, we look at the drop down without Steven Adams and without Brandon Clark. Tillman is the fifth big. He's the, he's, he's the fifth, he's been the fifth big on this team when they've been healthy. And beyond was like, you know, out on the street, you know, <laughs> waiting to get signed somewhere. And so that's a pretty big drop off from not only from Adams to, to Biombo, but from Adams Clark to Biombo Tillman. That's a pretty big drop off. It is. Um and it is it's worth noting we've seen Brandon Clark dunking and stuff on social media recently. So til- so since the last time we spoke, Taylor Jenkins did address this briefly before yes. I think before the Spurs game. Yes. I thought I thought his comments were interesting. Um it's one of the things you could read into a little bit. He was asked about Brandon Clark and he he didn't reference like the Mark Spears report of Clark saying he'd be back around the All Star break. He referenced the video stuff you just mentioned. I think he 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 uh, he assumed what he pe- what he picked up from the question that was put down was this implication that Clark is going to be back in the near future. He didn't say that exactly, but he said he said you know you know Clark's been been progressing well. But I'm paraphrasing. Been pro- progressing well. You've seen the videos. Blah, blah blah. There's been no change to the timeline. So that's interesting to me for two reasons. One, has anyone ever said what a timeline is? I don't nope. know what timeline are we talking about. And, and so it begs the question, okay, what's the timeline? Um, and then B, I thought the subtext of what he said was to pump the brakes. When he said no change to the timeline, I think he's referencing the public assumption we've yeah. had that Clark would not be back this season. And so I think that was Taylor Jenkins' way to sort of pump the brakes on the expectation of Clark being back around the all-star break, which is what we kind of said, because you don't a player's expectation of when they are going to come back is always going to be shorter than that. was that was not, I'm not saying what, what Clark told the reporter in this case is wrong, but it is the best case scenario. He is expressing the most optimistic scenario, right? Yes, for sure. We can't end this podcast without talking about, we mentioned, social media is ugly right now. There are a lot of people unhappy with Taylor Jenkins yep. at the moment. What do you make of, and the Grizzlies passed the blame game around last right. night. Um, Taylor Jenkins took accountability, said the team came out flat. I got to do a better job of preparing them. The players, Desmond Bain, Zaire Williams, basically said it has nothing to do with him. We're grown men. We got to show up and play harder, have the energy straight from the jump. Um, And, I mean, even Ja mixed in some comments there, essentially on, like, 
we got to be able to stop the bleeding when these teams are just taking, making runs and just taking huge leads on us early in the game or second and third quarter. Um, who does the blame fall on? Um, <laughs> go back to the column I didn't write early in the season where I was going to do the blame rankings. Uh, and my blame rankings, the top two by far at the time, one of these no longer applies to the team that was on the floor last night. But at the time, my, the top two of my blame rankings, and with everything, anything else that isn't third, was John ja Moran and the basketball guides, because John ja was not there for the first twenty-five games. Uh, it, it, it's 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 the roster issues he's had to deal with is the number one thing. But I I don't, and I've been pretty consistent on this this season. If you're looking for, if you're looking for the discernible imprint or fingerprints of coaching making a bad situation better. I think it's hard to find this season. I, I don't think I don't think Taylor Jenkins has been the problem, but I don't. I, it's hard to see like you know miracles being worked, you know, with what you have to work with. You know, I I, I don't I don't look at it and say, man, he's really coaching the heck out of this this flawed roster. I look at it and say, he's struggling with a flawed roster. Yeah, I think there it's it's fair to question certain uh, elements of what Jenkins does, right? This is a team that we talked about that struggles to shoot the three, yet is taking a lot of threes. And mathematically, that's that's not good. Um, this is a there has been inconsistencies in the rotation that he plays, but in his defense, the team's not winning, so he's trying different things. That's right. Um, it's which, almost like a Marco Polo or whatever, where you know you try to fix one thing and something else pops up, and like all of this. So. Yeah. Uh, while I think he's not, he shouldn't be absent of criticism this season. To point to Taylor Jenkins and try to kind of throw everything on him, um, I don't know if that's entirely fair. And I think you deserve a little bit of the benefit of the doubt based on what you've accomplished before. You know, right. I was on Jason and John earlier today, um, and they were talking about you know front office decisions and whatnot, and the draft and how the draft has caused problems. And I was like, well, like. The, this team did draft Desmond Bain and Brandon Clark and Santi Aldama. You got to evaluate the entirety of, of of someone's resume and not just, you know, it, it, it's this weird thing. And to me, it's almost more it's more reflective of front office and coaching in terms of how fans and people react. Where when things are going well, you focus on the good decisions and you sort of ignore and forget about the bad decisions. And when things are going poorly, it flips the other way. And so, like, when the Grizzlies won 56 games two years ago, no one was complaining about trading for Justice Winslow. You know, you forget about that. Right. And now that things are going poorly, like, you know, you, you know, you no longer get credit for plucking Desmond Bain out of thin air. You know, it's you, you got to take the totality of it. And the reality is that long resumes, which which Zach Kleiman is now getting at this point, long resumes are always mixed resumes. You know, yes. always, you know, it's just, you, you all, there's always a mix and like over time you do evaluate it. And, but I think, I don't know, I, I think, I think that there's, there's an undue focus on what's gone wrong instead of the totality of, of, of what's, what's the, the decisions that have been made. It is fascinating though. I mean, for being honest, NBA coaches have typically a very short leash, right? Taylor like Jenkins they, is probably, probably top five at this point, I'm going to guess in longevity. Yeah, um, Popovich is by far the most, of course. and then Spolter is Eric Spolter is by far Steve second. Steve Kerr's been there longer. I think Kerr. I think Michael Malone. After those four, I'm not sure if there are many, if any, who have been with their teams longer than Taylor Jenkins. Yeah, um, but I mean, like, look, look at what's happening with the Lakers, right? The Lakers want to. Yeah, Darvin Ham's in trouble. The, ch- the they Lakers spanked the Grizzlies in the playoffs. Yeah, and the Lakers won a championship and then fire their coach the next season. That's, this is true. And the Lakers now, you know, made a run to the Western Conference Finals, and they're not having a good season. They're already talking about Darvin Ham being in trouble. So it is true that it is just a very volatile job, right? You like coaches circle in and out uh, of franchises all the time. So, um. I don't think Taylor Jenkins should be absent of criticism, but I think it's going a little far to be like Taylor Jenkins has got to go. He's the reason for this for the struggles this season. Like that, the, and the, and it should be noted, the players clearly like Taylor Jenkins, right? This isn't right. a Lakers situation that we have going on here in Memphis, at least to our knowledge at this point. Right. So, um, 
I I think it's a it's, it can be a little overblown. It was a, it was a frustrating loss last night, and it got really ugly online. To no one's surprise, they are. And this is they've slipped a little bit recently. You look at the the Sac- Sacramento game. Actually, I I was pretty critical of the approach to that game. The Sacramento game, the Denver game, some of these. So they, there's been some slippage recently over the course of the season. I wonder how many I, your average Grizzlies fan that's not looking at oh, looking up stats on the internet. Where would they think the Grizzlies are ranked defensively this season? They probably wouldn't guess twelfth. You know, they probably guess twenty fifth or something. Yeah, like their twelfth defense. The defense is sort of held up amid all of all of the problems and all the in and out and all the everything else, and that tends to be something you people look at in terms of coaching. Like that that coaching can sort of impact your defense a little bit more, regardless of personnel, than your offense. I do think that um, that is a bit of a positive sign because the defense was really poor in the games leading up. Uh, to the Spurs when they lost three in a row. Right. I mean, I, I believe the Grizzlies had allowed... They'd gotten up to seventh or eighth or something like that, and they've slipped back down. Yeah, they point. they had allowed opponents to shoot 49% or better only eight times last season, and they did it in three straight games, three straight losses, um, leading up to that Spurs game, and it was better. And it wasn't particularly good in the first half against Toronto, but it was really good in the fourth quarter right. uh, when the team was making that run. And that's just the difference for this team right now. Like, this, if you continue to fall behind in these games, and it's like the same storyline every freaking game, it feels like, where it's like, is this a fake comeback or is this a real comeback for the right. Grizzlies late in the game? If you continuously fall behind in these games and you allow these big runs and can't stop the bleeding, then you're going to lose a lot of basketball games. And I think that was a point uh, you heard Zaire Williams make last night, which is uh, pretty spot on. Okay. Before we get out of here, the next seven games for the Grizzlies. Lakers, at the Lakers, at the Suns, at the Mavericks, home against the Clippers, home against the Knicks, uh, home against the Warriors, and at Minnesota. The Warriors seven game games. is the MLK Day game, and then the at Minnesota is, is also a national TV game on TNT. And, and, and ESPN. And uh, ESPN. The, the, the Lakers. So three of the next seven are on national TV. Jaws back now, so the national TV is going to start picking up. What's it's, their it's, a, it's a rough. What, what's their record in the, over those seven games? I, I will say three and four. That's what I was going to say too. I, three and four is what I would say. I, you know, um, and and can you go three and four in that stretch and 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 get into the play in? Doesn't seem likely. No. no, I mean you. We talked about it when Ja came back. You got to win two out of every three. That's essentially what you have to do. You have yeah. to win two out of every three. Well, if you if you so, pack some three and O's in there, you could have some some one and twos, you know. To, you but, started four and O, and then right, you right, lost right. three straight. Um, right. So they are. What are they now with Jaw? Five and four. Five and three with Jaw on the floor because he missed the game at Denver. But five and four since he's come back. Five and four since he come. Yeah. So not pacing there for nope. two out of every three. Um, Better, but not, yeah. not not enough to make up the ground. We'll see what happens. The Grizzlies are on the road a lot this month. Um, I'm going to try to get to some games cause this is it. Like, you know, this is, it's, it's now or never for this team. If they're going to try to make a postseason run, they're at home, like all of February. So, um, I, I say all of February, they, they have an early road trip in February. And I think they have only two more road games the whole rest of the month. Uh, every other game is and, at home. And one of those is February 28th. Yeah. Um, so if they can be competitive, if they can just be competitive through January, then it sets up for potentially a fun opportunity for the Grizzlies to try to make a run back um, and play a lot of home games in front of the crowd at FedEx Forum. So for that sake, I really hope that this road trip uh, goes well for Memphis and that uh, everybody can, you know, stay up with this team stay with the team um and keep reading our stuff over at the daily memphian i think that's going to do it for us this week um but until next week for drew and for chris we're out of here